I'll keep you safe until you're well again. Oh, I get it. You don't know what day it is, do you? It's opposite day. Opposite day is the one day of the year when you get to act different. Normally, you're really loud and annoying, so what are you going to be today? Quiet and out of the way! Yay! Happy opposite day for converting capacity and volume. We're going to go backwards today. Here's a quick recap on what we learned on Monday. So basically, I showed you how one gallon can be split up into four equal quarts. I told you that a quick way to remember this is four quarters makes one dollar, four quarts makes a gallon. Then I showed you that one quart can be split up into two pints. So one quart is the same amount of capacity or volume as two. And then I showed you how one pint can be split up into two cups. So these have the same capacity on the left, you have pints on the right, you have two cups. Finally, I don't have a visual for this one, but one of these cups can be split up into eight fluid ounces. For your notes today, I want you guys to split your page right in the middle. We're gonna first practice from gallons to quarts. And on the other side, I want you guys to write from quarts to gallons, which is the opposite. From gallons to quart, go ahead and make sure to draw an arrow because we were multiplying by the relationship of gallons and quarts. Remember, in one gallon, one gallon equals four quarts. That's a G and that's a Q. So we multiply by four. But because today is opposite, we're gonna go from quarts into gallons. The opposite of multiplication is division. What you divide though is still the relationship. So you still divide by four. Now this is what's going on. If you have four gallons of milk and you wanna break them up into quarts, what you do is you're gonna be able to create one gallon, two gallons, three gallons, four gallons. You're gonna be able to pour them into four. That is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. How do I get to sixteen quarts? Well, I multiply four times four, and it's going to be sixteen. Four gallons equal. 16 quarts. Now the opposite of that is literally having 16 quarts and turning them into gallons. That's a key, Q, sorry. Turning them into gallons. So what you're gonna do here is you're gonna pour them uh, into groups of four. So you're gonna take, of the 16, you're gonna pour into one gallon. One, two, three, four quarts makes one gallon. You use up four of the 16. You're gonna pour another four into one gallon. So it's gonna be five, six, seven, eight. That's going to be two gallons. Uh, but we used up eight, we can keep going. We've made up three gallons. That's going to be nine, 10, 11, 12. So far we've made three gallons. And we used up 12, we have 16, so we can keep going. Thirteen, 14, 15, 16. With my 16 quarts, I can make four gallons. What did I do, guys? Well, I divided actually 16 quarts into groups of four. That's a group of four, that's a group of four, that's a group of four, that's a group of four. So, one, can't do that. You bring down your six. It's gonna be four, eight, 12, 16. One, two, three, four. Four times four equals 16. And that's it. That's four. The answer is four. What did we do? We divide it, which is the opposite of multiplication.
Here are the picture of the notes so far. So if you got lost, go ahead and pause it right here and copy those down. All right, so let's keep going. Let's go ahead and convert five gallons into quarts. Let's see how many that's gonna be. Well, you're gonna have to multiply five times four, which equals 20. Now, because today is opposite day, we're gonna get those uh, 20 quarts back into gallons. So you're gonna take those 20 quarts and you're gonna split them up into groups of four. Again, four, eight, 12, 16, 20, one, two, three, four, five, Now, if you have a remainder, remember, you're going to leave it as a mixed up number. But right now, you have no remainder. That's going to be five gallons. So over here, we multiplied. Over here, we divided. Why? Because I went from gallons to quarts. And then I went the opposite way from quarts back to gallons. So I do the opposite thing of multiplication, which is division. All right, go ahead and pause the screen right here and copy all of this down. What I want you guys to notice is that at the very, very top, I wrote one gallon equals four quarts. That is your relationship. To get the one to four, the number one, to, to get it to look like a number four, you have to multiply one times four. Now, to get the four back into one, well, you just divide four divided by four, which is one. Um, so on the left-hand side, we're going to do gallons into quarts. On the right-hand side, we're going to do quarts into gallons. So right uh all these problems down leave those spaces i'm gonna do one and three with you and then you are expected to do two and four on your own all right let's go and get started with number one how do i get seven gallons into quarts well how do i get gallons into quarts i gotta multiply by four you should have already had enough time to copy this down if you had paused the last screen um so seven times four equals 28. that's it all right, today is opposite day, so we're going to take the 28 back into groups of four to make them into gallons. So I'm going to divide 28 divided by four. Zero on top, zero on the bottom. That equals 28. So that's going to be 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, 24, and then 28. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven gallons equals 28 quarts. All right, go ahead and do number two on your own. You're going to convert three gallons into quarts, and then you're going to convert 25 quarts into gallons. Remember that if you, uh, div you divide 25 by four and you get a remainder, you're going to put that as a mixed number. And I'll show you what I mean on number three all right let's go ahead and do number three you should have already done number two so you're going to turn nine gallons into quarts how do i get gallons into quarts i multiply by four nine times four equals 36 so in nine gallons you have 36 now let's go ahead and get 17 quarts back into gallons well what do i do i divide which is the opposite of the other side because it's opposite day so we're going to divide 17 into groups of four. Again, four, eight, 12, 16. Ah, if I do one more, it's going to be 20, which I don't have enough quarts to make another gallon. So you can only make one, two, three, four of those. You can use up 16 of the quarts. You're going to have a remainder of one. Now, this is what you should have done on the last one because you, you're gonna have a remainder with 25 quarts also so you, you're gonna have four and one fourth of a gallon so four holes because that's your answer on top and the remainder becomes a fraction one over four so 17 quarts equals four and one fourth of a gallon all right go ahead and complete number four you're gonna get six gallons into quarts and then you're gonna get 13 quarts into gallons remember to do the correct um, operation if you're going from gallons to quarts it is multiplying and if you're going from quarts to gallons it is divide but wait there's more 
Here is your UPSI, your order of operations, and your fraction of the day. Your UPSI says, in America, most blocks use a total of 88.35 gallons of water each day. Now, I missed something extremely important on here. I forgot to write that there is an average of six houses on a block. So they already give you the total, and you should, and you should know that there's six houses on each block. If every house on a block used the same amount of water, how many gallons of water does each house use? So they give you the total, and I just told you there's six houses in the middle six, okay? Now your order of operations is 28 multiplication bracket parentheses 24 divided by 3 parentheses minus 3 bracket. Your fraction, Ricardo uses a total of 12 pies for the school picnic. He bakes, not uses, sorry. He will serve each guest of, of the picnic a third of a pie. How many guests can Ricardo share his pie with? So in order to share the pie, think about what he needs to do to those pies. Uh, good luck, guys. Send your work to the following uh, phone. You have to send it to 210-764-9790. See you guys on Friday. All right, guys, this is Mr. Ibarra's lesson. So here you go. Good morning, guys. We are going to be continue with uh, measurements, converting measurements. Vamos a continuar con uh, las medidas de volumen y capacidad. Pero ahora vamos a irnos de las medidas más chiquitas a las medidas más grandes. Por ejemplo, vamos a ir de, de cuartos de un galón a un galón. A pintos a cuartos de, de un galón tazas a pintas y onzas líquidas a tazas. Ok, buenos días. Vamos a empezar con volumen y capacidad. En que ahora lo vamos a estar moviendo para el otro lado. De cuartos de un galón a un galón. Y cuando lo movemos, lo movemos de la mano izquierda, derecha a la mano izquierda, necesitamos que dividir. Aquí tenemos 16 cuartos de un galón. Sabemos que necesitamos 4 para agarrar un galón. En que voy a dibujar los 16 aquí. Necesito 4, lo voy a poner en grupos de 4. Y sé que 4 va en 16. 4 veces 4 por 4 es 16. Y no me va a sobrar nada. En que tengo 4 galones. Es, es equivalente a 16 cuartos. Por aquí abajo tengo 14 cuartos. Voy a dibujar 14 cuartos. Lo voy a poner en grupos de 4. Me sale 3 grupos. Como me faltan 2 en que me va a tener tres galones con dos cuartos. Ahora en este ejemplo lo vamos a ir de pintas a cuartos de un galón. Si tengo 10 pintos, cuántos cuartos de un galón, necesito que dibujar 10 modelos y yo sé que necesito dos pintos para cada cuarto, lo voy a poner en grupos de dos, me salen cinco grupos en que dos va entre, entre 10 5 veces, no me sobra nada, en que 10 pintos va a ser 5 cuartos. Ahora en este ejemplo tengo 7 pintos, los voy a dibujar aquí, los voy a poner en grupos de 2, me salen 3 cuartos enteros y un pinto que me sobra. En el ejemplo aquí, 2 va en 7 3 veces, 2 por 3 es 6 y me queda 1 y me sobra 1, 3 cuartos y 1 pin. Ahora, moviéndose a tazas, a pintas. Si tengo 6 tazas, yo sé que necesito 2 tazas para cada pinto. Voy a dibujar 6 tazas, lo voy a poner en grupos de 2. Tengo 3 en que 6 tazas me da 3 pintas. 2 Entre 6 va 3 veces, 3 por 2 es 6, no me sobra nada. Ahora si tengo 9 tazas, voy a dibujar las 9 tazas, las voy a poner en grupos de 2, me dan 4 grupos enteros y uno que me sobra, en que 2 va en 9, 4 veces, 4 por 2 es 8, me queda 1, 4 pico. Ahora la última, van a ser onzas líquidas a tazas, que necesito 8 onzas para cada taza si tengo 24 onzas voy a dibujar las 24 
puedo poner en grupos de 8 me dan tres tazas enteras y no me sobra nada pero si tengo 11 onzas líquidas voy a dibujar las 11 puedo poner en grupos de 8 solamente me da un grupo y me van a sobrar 3 en que la respuesta va a ser una taza con 3 onzas líquidas que me sobran necesito que ustedes dibujen las notas y luego van a hacer una estos son los problemas que tienen que uh, cumplir uh, tienen que convertir uh, si 3 galones a 4 cuartos y 25 cuartos a galones 6 galones a cuartos y 13 cuartos a galones les di ejemplo de 1 y 3, tienen que completar el número 2 y el número Y por último, tienen que responder estas tres preguntas. En Estados Unidos, la mayoría de los, de los bloques usan un total de 88.35 galones de agua por día. Aquí se me olvidó escribir que hay 6 casas en cada bloque. Si cada casa en un bloque usa la misma cantidad de agua, ¿cuántos galones de agua usa cada casa? Ya les dieron el total de galones y hay seis casas. Tienen que responder esa pregunta. Ahí está el, el problema de orden de operaciones y luego la fracción que dice Ricardo ordena un total de 12 pasteles para el picnic escolar. Servirá a cada, a cada invitado del picnic un tercio de un pastel. ¿Con cuántos invitados puede compartir su pastel, Ricardo? Todo esto lo tienen que mandar al próximo. All right, send your work from Mr. Ibarra, 210-802-6944. Manden el, el trabajo a mis, al señor Ibarra, al número 210-802-6944. Good morning, fifth grade. I hope everybody is doing well. Thank you to those of you who have submitted Monday's assignment. Several of you have not, so please make sure that you are submitting that. All three subjects, reading, math, and science. We're going to go ahead and get started on today's lesson. Okay, so today's lesson, we are going to focus on being able to recognize characteristics and structures of informational text including the central idea, remember central idea, key idea, main idea, all similar things with supporting evidence. We will also be able to recognize characteristics and structures of informational text, including organiz organizational patterns, such as logical order and order of importance. Now, organizational pattern, we've talked about that. Um, it was a while back, but it was basically when we talked about is the author using problem and solution, cause and effect, chronological order. Um, that's what they're referring to when they're talking about organizational pattern, how the author organizes the information in the story. Just to refresh our memory, I want you to take a look at this table. It is not in your book, but I want you to pay attention as I read it. Organizational patterns of informational text. So on the left hand side there we have organizational pattern and then the definition is in the middle and then the signal words. So the signal words are the words that we could look for in um, the story that is going to help us um, understand or determine which organizational pattern the author is using. So let's look at the first one there. It says order of importance. Rank ranks reasons for most important to least important or vice versa. Our signal words are most important, best, highest, least important, worst, and lowest. Logical order provides information in an order that suits the topic to begin, next, also finally to summarize. Okay. Compare and contrast explains the similarities and differences. Our signal words are similar, alike, different, in contrast, on the other hand. Cause and effect lists one or more causes and one or more effects. Our signal words are reason, cause, since, because, as a result, and so. Problem and solution. Describes a problem and suggest one or more solutions. Our signal words are problem, issue, challenge, solution, solve, answer. Chronological order. List events in the order in which they occurred. 
before, first, next, then, after, at the same time, and finally. The last one there, we have description. Remember, when we think of description, we think of describe. So it explains a topic, especially a person, place, thing, or idea. Signal words, for example, such as type, characteristic, and feature. So all of these are organizational patterns. And one of the things, although we still will be talking about the central idea in today's story, I also want you to be thinking about what organizational pattern is the author using in the story, one, and two, why would he choose to do that? Why would he choose cause and effect over description or whatever the case is? Okay, I want you to open up your books to page 330 and I want you to take pause the video and take a few minutes to read this page. And there are some things that I want to point out to you. I want you to look at this second sentence here and it states a central idea is the big idea the author wants readers to know about the topic so that right there is important remember central idea main idea key idea supporting evidence provides specific information to support this big idea so this right here these are the legs of the top of your desk this is the top of your desk and these are your legs okay and then an organizational pattern is the way the author chooses to organize the central ideas and supporting evidence in a text to help readers understand the big idea. So organizational pattern is the way they organize the story, okay? And that's where we have cause and effect, um, problem and solution, chronological order. Now, if you look at the next section there, they're telling us that these bullet points here are what we can do to help determine the central idea, the supporting evidence, and the organizational pattern. So these will help with those three things. Here we have a graphic organizer that can help you identify the central idea and the supporting evidence. Typically we don't have six supporting evidences or supporting details, I should say. Um, so typically our graphic organizer would be main idea and then we'd have three supporting um, evidence our details and then down here these are the the questions that you're going to be thinking about as we're reading today's story number one what is the topic of the text so what are they talking about number two what important details are in the text so you're supporting details three what is the central idea the author wants me to know so what's the main idea Four, what organizational pattern does the author use to write the text? So that's the list of, of things that I gave you a little while ago with problem and solution, cause and effect, etc. And then number five, how does the author organize the central idea and supporting evidence in the text? Okay, so today's story is on page 331 and it is titled A Soldier's Diet. I want you to take a second to make sure you write um, your name and date, of course, RNAG, RQPC, and NAG. The first thing I want you to think about before you start reading this story is look at the title. The title is A Soldier's Diet. So I want you to take a second and I want you to write somewhere on your paper there, you have plenty of room. I want you to write down based on the title, what do you think the author might want us to learn from this text? Go ahead and write a sentence or so down without reading the story. I just want you to just base it off of the title. What do you think the author might want us to learn? Okay, now you are going to complete R, NAG, R. So again, I'm not going to read the story for you this week because I did it all last week. So you're going to go ahead and read. You're going to complete narrator, author's purpose, and genre. And then you are going to reread. Once you've done those three things, go ahead and check it off and then resume the video. Okay, let's get started on the questions. Number one, which sentence best states the central idea? So my key words, sentence 
best states and central idea of the text. So what it's asking me for is what was the main idea of the entire story, okay? So your proof for this one would be whole story. Number one, Civil War soldiers were strong. B, Civil War soldiers had limited food supplies. C, Civil War soldiers were cold and hungry. D, Civil War soldiers participated in long battles. Think of the big picture on this question. What did the author mainly want me to know about these soldiers? Okay, let's take a look at number two. Number two, the author organizes the text too. So it's asking about organizational pattern. What are, why are they organizing the text the way that they are? F, to tell about the changes in a soldier's diet over time. G, to describe how soldiers prepared their food. H, to explain the reasons why soldiers were often hungry. J, to categorize the main sources of a soldier's food. There are a lot of keywords in these answer choices that you need to be highlighting before you eliminate any answers. And the last one, number three, which sentence from the text supports the idea that Civil War soldiers made sacrifices? So they're telling me that it's already going to come from the text, okay? All of these are in italics, and we already know when they're in italics, they're coming directly from the story. Now, it's asking me, though, which one supports this idea here, that Civil War soldiers made sacrifices. So I want you to stop and think, what does sacrifices mean? That's one. Once you figure out what sacrifices means, go through and that'll help us identify which one of these shows me that they did make sacrifices. A, but they have, I'm sorry, but have they ever considered what life was like for a Civil War soldier? B, both Union and Confederate soldiers received rations. C. However, the jerky the soldiers ate came from the worst parts of the pig or the cow. D. In fact, Confederate and Union soldiers would often trade items with one another just to get more coffee. So think about which one of these proves to me, shows me that they made sacrifices. That's my key term. There is a very good distractor in this one, guys, so please make sure you are paying attention to the keywords. Okay, so at this point, you should have RNAG RQP checked off. I will ask you, please make sure that you're checking your work. Um, some of our grades are a little bit low on our quizzes, um, so I need you to please, please make sure that you're rereading, that your answers are making sense, um, because some of us are just kind of rushing through it, and there's no need to rush, guys. Also, a reminder, you do have two chances. If you don't do well the first time, the expectation is to go back and reread the story, review the questions you got wrong, and then resubmit. Don't just guess the second time. Again, you do not have to send me pictures anymore um, of your work. You will click on the link below and you will submit your answers on quizzes. You have two chances. Remember that. So that concludes our lesson, um, but I will say that I need you on Tuesdays and Thursdays from here on out. I need you to make sure that you are logging into Learning Farm on those two days. We're only posting videos on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Um, so that means on Tuesdays and Thursdays, the way that I can get you to um, take attendance or, or participation grade is for you to log into Learning Farm. Remember, I can see what you're doing. I can see how long you're on there. So I need you on Tuesdays and Thursdays, a minimum of 30 minutes uh, logging into Learning Farm for reading, okay? Um, I also need you to make sure that you're checking in with your teachers and saying, you know, here present, your um, either you're texting or your parents are, are texting, okay, through Remind or through our Google Voice phone number. So again, please make sure that you are doing Learning Farm Tuesdays and Thursdays. Bye, guys. Hey guys, 
guys, good morning. Today for our lesson, we're just gonna go through some notes and take a short quizzes. Don't forget that your scavenger hunts are due tomorrow. If you need help, let me know. Call the number at the end of this video. Big shout out to those of you who have already sent me something. Um, I've gotten amazing pictures and examples of things that you're finding around your house. So you guys are blowing it out of the water. Keep up the good work. On days that we don't have video lessons, I do want you logging into Learning Farm. So if you don't remember your username or password, just reach out. We all have that information for you. Let's go ahead and get started for today. All you will need today is either your science journal or notebook paper and a pen or a pencil. So last Monday we talked about some natural changes to the ecosystem and changes that are caused by man. Today we're going to go a little bit deeper into what humans do to the environment. Now I want you to take a minute, pause the video, and copy down the notes on a piece of notebook paper. examples of how humans make changes to lands, water, and air. So first we have humans drain wetlands to build houses and humans turn fields into landfills for trash. So if you notice in this next picture that I'm going to show you, we've taken an open area and it's just completely covered in piles and piles of trash. We know that that causes harm to the original environment. different activities that cause changes to waters. Sometimes humans take too much fresh water for various reasons and this causes rivers and streams to dry up. And humans also dump trash or harmful chemicals into water. Now we talked a little bit about pollution to the air when we discussed the burning of fossil fuels but we have different ways of transportation like cars, buses, trains, etc. have to use fuel that pollutes the air. Also factories, when they're making things, sometimes they burn chemicals and gases and this causes pollution to the air. So it's really important for us to know how we cause changes to the environment, thinking about ways that it harms the land, the water and the air, but also thinking about what animals are having to do because of the changes that we bring to their environment. To demonstrate your understanding of today's lesson, I don't need a picture of your notes, but you are going to complete a quizzes. So look underneath the video, find the Science Miss Broberg quizzes link, click on it. You'll have four questions to complete, just um, looking at different examples and identifying whether it's bringing a change to the land, the water, or the air. Please don't forget that your scavenger hunt is due tomorrow on Thursday. I'm gonna put a link up or a slide up that has the phone number for you to text a picture of your work. You're trying to find as many examples as you can. You don't have to have an actual picture of the example, but you do need to at least write down what you found and what it is an example of. Your mission is complete. Return to base. Hey, ¿qué tal? ¿Cómo le van? Hoy vamos a estar discutiendo de cambios humanos en el medio ambiente. Quiero que me escriban los ejemplos de los tres que tenemos ahí. Y lo van a usar para la prueba que van a tomar el viernes. Pero necesitan que escribir las notas para que tengan ahí una referencia para poder contestar las preguntas. 
Aquí tenemos los cambios humanos en el medio ambiente y los ejemplos. El primero va a ser cambios a la tierra. En cambios a la tierra, los humanos drenen las humedades para construir casas, conviertan los campos a vertederos para basura, cambios al agua, los humanos toman demasiado agua dulce y hace que los ríos arroyos se sequen y los humanos arrojan, arrojan basura o productos químicos nocivos. Y el último ejemplo va a ser cambios al aire, donde los automóviles, autobuses, trenes, etc. utilizan combustibles que contaminan el aire y las fábricas contaminan el aire cuando queman productos químicos y gases. Por favor escriben sus notas en sus diarios y escriban todos los ejemplos que les ha dado aquí. Buena suerte el viernes. Okay, Mr. Ibarra's class, so underneath this video, you're going to see two links. You need to find the one that says Mr. Ibarra's Science Quizzes. Now, the quizzes is going to be both in English and in Spanish, so regardless of the language that you prefer to take the quiz in, find Mr. Ibarra's link so you can be directed to his class. Good luck! <laughs>